Hi, welcome to Atlassian Tech TV. My name's Chris Mountford, and I take you inside Atlassian to show you how we make software. In this episode, I sit down with software architect Robbie Gates. In addition to his engineering skill set, Robbie has a significant experience as a mathematician in a branch of algebra that the locals know as category theory. Though he's given talks at Atlassian on this topic and how it forms the theoretical basis of functional programming, we stay shallow on the math this time. Across this two-part interview, Robbie and I also chat about technical leadership and the role of a software architect. But first, we take a brief trip down memory lane to that magical time in any programmer's life, their first computer. Welcoming today, Robbie Gates to Atlassian Tech TV. Uh, thanks very much for coming and talking to us. You're an architect on the, it's now it's the Vertigo team. It's that's, that's, what, that's the internal name for it. It's, it's a team which is about uh, application transformation and moving what were server-based applications to a more cloud-friendly slash cloud-native architecture. Right, cloud-native architecture. So we've got some stuff to talk about already. Um, let me first, though, ask you, this is my favourite question to kick things off. You know, how, tell me about yourself. How, you, how did you get into software? That's an interesting question. I think... So I first saw a computer when I was in grade five or something, so what's that, 11 years old, and my dad brought home a computer, an Apple II, uh, Apple because II. he wanted to put VisiCalc on it and do, uh, do his, his accounts. I, I was absolutely fascinated by it. It's hard to estimate how amazing it is when you can actually, you could change what it did, right, in a yeah. way that it was like a toy that was infinitely variable. And, more, and, and as you discovered more of what you could do, you could do more things. And I think that kind of, being able to, to change things, I think, is what's really appealing about that stuff. And so I was kind of fascinated with computers all, all through school. I spent a lot of time playing games. Mm. I spent a lot of time uh, reverse engineering things to understand how they worked. I think that's something that, that made it really... Once I realised, saw something happening, said, oh, how did they do that? And then being able to dig under the cover and go, oh, now I understand how they do that. Did, you, think... did you hack the game to give yourself infinite grenades or whatever it was? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there was one game that I... That I um that I played a lot of, and what what I actually discovered was that it had an engine and it had data files driving that engine, and I think that was kind of I think that's kind of typical these days. But at the time, maybe just because I didn't know how these things worked, I was amazed by it. And so I did spend a lot of time editing that database once I reverse engineered the format for it, and yeah. and understood. Oh look, I could actually make this weapon do ten times as much damage. Yeah. That would be it kind of gets boring after a while, right? Because you, know, <laughs> you just tend to win a lot. But uh, and I think you know understanding that game balance is what's really interesting about games is maybe something I learned ten years later. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, so I spent a lot of time fiddling with those things and just trying to get under the hoods and understand how they worked. And, and I think I was fascinated by the idea that the copy protection always fascinated me, right? <laughs> because how can they make that impossible, right? The game has to get into your computer. At that point, it's only ones and zeros, right? How can they stop me getting that somewhere else? And understanding some of the techniques involved in that made, gave me a, a more nuanced understanding of what's engineering and what's software, right? Yeah. Um, my story is pretty much the same. I, I wanted an Apple II, and the thing that awoke in me was this sense that, wow, you can make anything. You can, obviously, people who I was trying to explain this to felt that it was extremely limited and that you know, it only changed what was on some computer screen or whatever, and what, what did that matter? I think the, the interesting protections were based around exploiting physical limitations of the drives as well yeah, as... Yeah. And then having software which was built on top of that, right? So that's kind of the point at which I got interested in it. So. Right, well, let's um, fast forward to yeah, 20, so 2015. Yep. <laughs> Skipping a whole bunch of academia and other stuff that squished well, in actually, there. Well, actually, yeah, well, no, no, let, let's go into it then because we spoke um, at length really about very advanced mathematical concepts that you don't necessarily need for being a software developer, but at the same time, they're really at the heart of a lot of um, common techniques or ideas behind functional programming, mm -hmm. which is, I think it should be obvious to everyone, a, a major trend in software development. So do you want to give us a little bit of that history between perhaps the Apple II and the, and the architect? Well, so the, it's funny for me, right, because I, my, my fascination with computers was always really down at that low level, right? Like I yeah. still have a soft spot for assembly language programming and that kind of thing, even though <laughs> you don't do it these days, really. Well, not, uh, not, not in enterprise software anyway. On the anyway. weekends. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? There are games for that, right? Um, but the, I think at the same time, I was always good at maths through school, and so somehow I thought I would end up doing maths. And so I did a lot of maths at university. And the maths that I was into was category theory, which turned out to be really interesting for functional programming. 
I never really came at it from a functional programming angle. I was really coming at it from a kind of hardcore abstract algebra angle. And almost those two things didn't meet for me for a long time, right? And it's kind of weird. There, are, there will be functional programmers who know way more about the applications of category theory to functional programming because that, that I mean, there's no doubt there's a really tight nexus there and you, you know, the number of mono tutorials on the web is some indication of how interesting that is to people. But having said that, it's not, that's not an area that I really dug deep into. I was really, I had kind of mathematics on one bucket and computer science in the other bucket. And I think at the time that I was doing it, what I actually found valuable was that mathematics teaches you to be super picky about things. Why is that true? Why is that true? Why, why do you really believe this fact? What, what machinery can you put in place to help you understand that precise thing better? And that kind of thinking is actually very transferable to software. Yeah. It, it's dangerous in software because in software you don't have to get it 100% right and you do in mathematics. And I think that gap there is one of the important practical versus theoretical gaps which is hard to adapt to. But, um, but there's no doubt that, that doing mathematics made me a better programmer because it taught me to be, to be careful and to be accurate and to think hard about the, the abstract structures that we're dealing with. And it also it gives you a certain facility with dealing with abstract stuff. Um, having said that, there's no doubt that there are direct applications to functional programming, as you point out, which are of a lot of interest to people and are helping people build. Um, you know, there are teams here who swear by functional programming and give them lower defect rates and um, faster time to market and lets them build stuff uh, more efficiently and more correctly than they would without that, those kinds right. of techniques. I think a lot of people, uh, especially a lot of people who are professionals uh, in software or in technical uh, careers, they may have heard of functional programming. They may have been exposed to it in some way, they may have learned it at university, but they may not be very well versed in what it really is. Can you, given that you've got the sort of theoretical and the practical experience of how functional programming and, and the mathematics behind it work, can you sort of give an introduction to, to us, uh, what is it really, what is it when it comes down to programming? What, what, am, I, what am I gonna be trading off? Right, so, so to, I should actually say at the outset, I, I have less, practical experience of functional programming that I'd really like to. So a lot of my actual Same. practical experience has been really deep in imperative programming and, and where that's taken us. Um, having said so that... So imperative the, programming is in contrast to functional programming. So imperative programming is... is, is there's, there's some state and you write things that manipulate that state. Right. Um, so here's a chunk of stuff that you know and... Like you a might, for loop. Yeah, like a for loop. You'd come in and say, oh, well, here's a bit of data. I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to change it in the following way. I'm going to make a collection of them. I'm going to sort them. But you're, you're in place changing stuff around. Now, that makes a lot of sense when you haven't got much memory because you really need to move that stuff around. And you, don't, you can't make a copy of that stuff. Making copies was hideously expensive, both in terms of the resources you required and the time it took. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what FP is, is a better focus on is that we, under, under the conditions we often find ourselves in now, it's much better to say, don't change things. Changing things makes them really hard to reason about. When you stare at a bit of code and you look at that variable, what's the value in there? You can't just look, you can't look statically at that code. You can't look at the code frozen in time and say, oh, I see, you computed the value up here because you have to know, well, what was it last time? Because that computation depends on what it was the last time through. Mm. Whereas functional programming is much easier to reason about at that level. You can look at that code and say, well, what's the value of x? Oh, look. I put the value in up here and it can't have changed between there because right. things don't change in this model. So immutability is a common uh, feature of most of the programming environments that functional programming yeah. works in. And it's been pushed out to other environments as well. You know, but we use immutability as a day-to-day -day concept in Java as well, even though Java's yeah. not a functional language. Right. Um, it still gives us that ability to reason about concurrency in a way that we couldn't without that. Right. So there's, a, there's an approach to programming and there is support for that approach in specific programming languages. Right. So we've talked about Scala. That's an obvious choice for functional programming for someone with Java skills. Mm -hmm. It work interoperates with Java fairly well. Yeah. And, uh, and there are other languages as well. Um, one I like to point to is often JavaScript. Right. Because it has some features in it, I'd say, that are clearly functional. Absolutely. You know, there's this first class uh, functions are first class citizen yep. in the language and that's something that pretty much every programmer has to have exposure to JavaScript yeah but what are some others what are some other programming languages people could check out or oh so I guess Haskell is the big one that everyone points to now I'm not a Haskell guru I've written very little Haskell in my life far too, far less than I should have but I think the I think it's interesting that you single out JavaScript, right? Because that takes the view of functional programming that one of its critical things is functions are first class objects. So you can pick up a function, maybe bind some of its arguments, put some values in, but leave other ones undetermined and pass that chunk of functionality around as if it was an object. And that's really good for abstraction. It lets you abstract not just what is the shape of this data, but what can you do with this data. Mm. Um, 
the, the interesting thing about JavaScript is what it doesn't have is a type system, a, a strong static type system. And that type system is what people leverage in other functional languages to get stuff done. So I was just going to make sure, just bring everyone along. So a type system, if you're a JavaScript developer, maybe if it's your first programming language, you're thinking, well, you know, there are strings and, uh, in, in JavaScript and there are arrays and there are objects and the, I, I, I can ask the runtime system if it's a number or if it's a object or one, one of these things. That, that is a, a type system of sorts. Right. But comparing to other programming languages where you can't just say, I need a variable and then put a number in it and then later on put a string in it, the type system allows you to enforce or choose what the types of things, strings, numbers, whether they're kinds of objects, classes, instances of classes, uh, what they are. and, and then, uh, then that allows you, there's a certain immutability of what kind of thing that yeah. is. I think the, the key observation there is in your first description of JavaScript there, you just use the word runtime, right? It's all about dynamic typing. But what What is in that object, I can't tell when I'm looking at the source, and that makes it hard to reason about the source. Now, people right. use conventions to work around this. They might name variables in a certain way. Um, but the what if you contrast that with a statically typed system it has that property you refer to second which is that once you declare something in your program once you say here's an object of a particular kind it can only contain things of that kind and right. that immediately gives you a massive boost in your ability to reason when you as type systems get more powerful they let you define new types it's not all about strings and integers you can say well a string plus an integer is really a name and an age and that's a person and a person is a different kind of thing right what um an what object oriented programming uh, is about yeah it's enabling about, us to build types like that absolutely and i think what where um where functional programming really leaps off from there in a powerful way is that it lets you build types from types and focuses on constructing new types out of old types and the processes for constructing types. And this is where the kind of higher order features come in. Mm. And um, and the, the power of those higher order features is they, they let you abstract things that you otherwise couldn't abstract or that are difficult to abstract in other ways. And this is the where people form abstractions around, well, how does IO work in, a, in, a, um, in an immutable world? Or how does something else, which feels like it's about changing stuff, how do we express that? Mm. And it's really about, you know, sequencing transformations and stuff like that, which is where it kind of starts to mesh back into the mathematical analysis of, of you know, category theory is really about functions and processes and change. Right. And that's where it meshes into FP where you're saying, well, how do we sequence a bunch of functions together? What does that really mean? Right. And, and so that the, the really important thing there that's really going on is that all of this extra effort you put into the typing lets you know statically before you've run a single line of code much more about what's going to happen. In fact, so much more that there are certain Haskell programmers who will claim that once it compiles, it works. Yeah. Now, obviously, you're still going to test it because people make mistakes and stuff, but the fact is the more you can push up front, the more likely you are to have working code down the track. I've noticed that when I started learning Scala, I, I found that it was a lot more difficult to get to the point where it did compile, and I was right. thinking I was arguing with the compiler the whole time, and the compiler was pretty slow as well. But uh, I was amazed how much more it was the case that once it compiled, then there weren't any further problems or bugs to be, yeah. to be discovered. So, th so the interesting thing there is you use the phrase arguing with the compiler. I'd argue you're explaining it to the compiler. Explaining. The, the compiler is really <laughs> stupid. All it can do is match up really simplistic concepts. JavaScript, the, the, you can't explain anything to the compiler. There's no compiler to explain it to, really. Scala is somewhere, or well, I guess before you even get to Scala, Java has, you can explain some things. You can say that's a person. It can't fit in a, um, in a camera-shaped hole kind of mm. thing. And yet, um, but people can use cameras and you can start to express those basic things. Things. The more sophisticated a language you have, the more you can explain to the compiler and the more the compiler can say to you, actually, you can't do this to one of these things because you told me it was this shaped thing, right? right? And the more general you can make those uh, those kinds of explanations to the compiler, the more the compiler can help you to the point where you get your experience where mm. once it compiles, it's highly likely to work. Yeah. Or highly likely to, to do what the written code was intended to do. That's a different thing from working. <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, people may not care that it does what it's been designed to do. They may not want it to. Ah, I, you know, the, the the biggest change in my understanding of of programming since I've been a kid is realising that, that it... It's not about getting the program right. It's about making it do something that helps someone achieve a goal. Right? Making the right program. Right. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, yeah, it's very much about that. Yeah. Um, so there are things that functional programming give you that remove certain categories of defect that limit the ability for those surprises to interrupt you and to cause the product to have problems when it's running or mm. to cause it uh, to get stuck during deployment and problems being found then. So uh, is that the role of an architect to be thinking about these sorts of things and to help people with that? Architect is a really interesting role. I think there are as many definitions of that role as there are people in that role. 
Because what, it, what it's really about, I think, is providing technical leadership to a broad range of people, a broad range of teams, a broad range of people. And so one big part of that is exactly what you identify there. It's saying, here is a general class of techniques which are useful to this domain that you happen to find yourself in. Now, it might be that the, the domain is some kind of modern web architecture with microservices where FP really sits nicely and stateless services and all that kind of stuff push in the same direction and so it's a really good fit. And an architect can come in and say, look, if you build it in this way, there'll be less problems of this kind arising and so it's easier to, to build correct software if you do it that right. way. It's all about trade-offs at the end of the day and yeah. fit, taking the right, tech, the right technology mix that fits the kind of problem space you're trying to solve but also fits the the kinds of technologies that you've been trying to fit into that problem space. It's very rare that you can come to something completely greenfield and say, I'm going to start all over again and I'm going to pick the best technology and I'm going to build everything exactly suited to that particular silo. And even if you're lucky enough to find yourself in one of those projects, as I think I have like once in my life, very, very quickly the ground shifts and you know it's no longer greenfield. You're stuck with your own... Your own legacy. The, the mud from last week, right? And, yeah. And it's very, that happens so fast that it's more important to be adaptable, I think, than, than to have a, a pristine architectural vision in mind. Yeah.